Uh, can I welcome you all to lecture 10 in this uh, series of 10 lectures which were linked to the 10 chapters in my book uh, which is an introduction to economics basically for undergraduates who have never done any economics before so it's uh, simple theory basic economics that is very important that you understand before you try and build up some of the more complex issues in this subject. Before I start the, the last lecture, I need to announce the uh, winner of the Spot the Deliberate Mistake competition. Uh, well done, Jonathan Morrow. Uh, he spotted uh, in lecture five the fact that I had multiplied three by 150 and got the answer uh, 350 instead of 450. Uh, well done, uh, Jonathan. The, for those of you who want to go back and check this, that was the original mistake there. It was uh, weighting index numbers uh, and uh, I should have multiplied 3 by 150 and got 450. Instead, I got 350. So let's just change that should be 450, which of course then means that all this line here adds up incorrectly because it should end up at 1140, which when you divide by 10 should have added up to 114. So uh, that's the correction that goes with uh, lecture 5. Uh, my apologies for that and well done Jonathan for spotting that. We now move on to the 10th lecture. Uh, we've done macroeconomics, we've done microeconomics. We started with economics on a small scale, consumers, markets, firms, industries. We went on to macroeconomics where we looked at what economy is, should you measure it. Uh, we looked at the theories underlying uh, economics where, which could be useful when you're trying to understand that there is a difference between economists who want to intervene more in the economy and economists who want to intervene less in the economy. We looked at some of the problems, the macroeconomic problems in the economy, and we also looked at the macroeconomic policies designed to deal with those problems, which were monetary policy and fiscal policy. We're now taking the national economy, if you like, and put it, putting it into its world context. So this is all about uh, international economics, and uh, I've saved the best theory until the end, uh, as you'll see when we go through the theory of comparative advantage. So uh, I trust that uh, you will enjoy this. So we'll look at international trade. Why? Uh, we'll brief mention of the balance of payments and foreign exchange just to again introduce you to the theory and draw on some of the concepts that uh, you have already been introduced to earlier in the course. So we're going to start by looking at the theory of comparative advantage. Now before the theory of comparative advantage there was a recognition of absolute advantage. Adam Smith uh, recorded uh, what absolute advantage was in the wealth of nations. And then um, some debate about this, but David Ricardo uh, identified something even more important, which was comparative advantage. And you'll see why this is even more important and justifies uh, international trade being a, a benefit to all of us. So it's quite easy to understand absolute advantage. I'll give you an example uh, to illustrate that, and then I'll take you through to comparative advantage and hopefully you'll see the difference uh, between these two things. Now just suppose there were two countries, only two countries in the world, A and B, uh, you know, Australia and Britain if you like to think of uh, uh, real things, and there are only two products in the economy, uh, product X and product Y. So product X can be x-ray machines, can't they, and product Y can be yogurts if you like to think of real things. And we suppose that the two countries are identical in size and in the resources that they have available to them. And it's the way they mix these things and do things that creates the difference. 
So these numbers here suggest that if each country divided all of its productive resources in half, 50% producing X, 50% producing Y, then they could come up with these totals. Country A uh, could uh, produce uh, 100,000 units per time period uh, of X and only and 80,000 units of uh, Y. Country B, not so efficient, could produce 60,000 units of X, but better uh, on product Y, it can produce 90,000 units of X. So uh, we've got uh, a clear indication here that country A has got absolute advantage in the production of X, it can produce 100,000, and country B has got absolute advantage in the production of Y, because it can produce 90,000 as opposed to uh, country A's 80,000. So nice, simple illustration of absolute uh, advantage. Now, the important thing as we proceed from absolute advantage to comparative advantage is that you understand opportunity cost. You may remember opportunity cost was introduced to you right at the start in the first lecture. And if we took these numbers here for country A and for country B, then these are the opportunity costs of producing one X or one Y in each country. So in country A, the opportunity cost of producing one X is four fifths Y, and the opportunity cost of one Y is five fourths X. It's the inverse, always the inverse. That is, four fifths Y comes from 80,000 over 100,000, four fifths, or 100,000 over 80,000, five fourths. That's how you would read opportunity cost. Fairly easy to understand because what you're saying is if I want to produce one more x I'm going to have to give up producing four-fifths of a y or if I produce one less x I can produce another four-fifths of y and that goes for each of uh, those areas. Uh, uh, in country B the opportunity cost of producing one x is one and a half y and uh, one y is two-thirds x. Now the important thing to identify here is we've read left to right in order to identify opportunity costs. We now read up and down to work out who's got the lower opportunity cost and who's got the higher opportunity cost. So if we look at country A, uh, its uh, opportunity cost of 1x is 4 fifths y, which is less than 1 and a half y, 3 over 2 y. So the absolute advantage is quite clear for country A. It's got a lower opportunity cost for fifths Y. Country B, however, has got the lower opportunity cost of producing one Y, it's two thirds X, as opposed to five over four, one and a quarter X. So the opportunity costs confirm where the absolute advantage is. Now again, that's easy, simple to understand, which means that when we ask questions uh, uh, in uh, examinations, we're not really worried about absolute advantage because everything I've said so far is simple, isn't it? Uh, but comparative advantage, not so easy to understand, so you need to follow this one through uh, slowly and fairly carefully. So if we uh, change these numbers slightly, as illustrated here, or not, sorry, let me go back. Um, so many pages to deal with here. This was where we left off. And if we just translate that to here for absolute advantage, that is, if all of the resources in one country uh, produce the product for which you have the absolute advantage, then you would end up producing 200,000 units of X. You double the amount because everyone is now producing X. Uh, and uh, you would produce 180,000 units of Y. So you can see the increase uh, that uh, there is going up from 160 to 200,000 or 170,000 up to 180,000. 
So that's our absolute advantage finished. Now, change the numbers just slightly. I uh, don't really want to confuse you too much, but if we change the numbers now, so we've got A still producing uh, 100,000 and 80,000, but B now is not as good at producing either X or Y. B can only produce 60,000 units, whereas A can produce 100,000. B is producing uh, 50,000 units of Y, whereas A can produce 80,000. So we've got the opportunity costs, they're the same as before for A, 4 fifths Y, 5 fourths X. B now is 50,000 over 60,000, which gives you 5 6 Y, or 60,000 over 50,000, which gives you 6 fifths X. Now, on the face of it, you go, well, country A is more efficient at producing both things, so why on earth would it trade with country B, who's less efficient at producing everything? And this is the reason why. It is purely because the opportunity costs are different. Because these opportunity costs are different, uh, 4 fifths Y as opposed to 5 six Y, 5 fourths X as opposed to 6 fifths X, they are different. We can rearrange the production of these resources between both countries to produce more and to increase the amount, therefore, of products available to produce with the same use of resources. That's the important thing. So what you have got here is a situation of comparative advantage. A has got absolute advantage in both things, no doubt about that, but B has got a comparative advantage, a lower opportunity cost in the production of product Y. Now let me show you what that would mean. when we take this a little a stage further. We've got here some numbers which are again not much different from before. A has still got absolute advantage in the production of X and Y. B uh, it has got a disadvantage in the production of X and Y, but the numbers are slightly changed. So A produces 100,000 X, B can do 90,000. A can produce 80,000 Y, B can do 72,000. Now if you work out the opportunity costs here, everything looks similar to the previous example, but the opportunity costs now are exactly the same. It's 4 fifths Y, 5 fourths X for both country A and country B. Now it is not possible for me to rearrange resources here and increase the total production of X and Y. It's just not possible under these circumstances. So here we have a case of absolute advantage, country A, and no comparative advantage, so there can be no gains from these countries specialising and trading. No gains at all under these circumstances. Now, if we take this one stage further, because what I've said to you is, as long as one country has a comparative advantage, that is a lower opportunity cost of producing something, we can produce more. That's the criteria by which you can judge that uh, everyone can be better off if they specialise and trade. And let me take you to a different example here, uh, but much more extreme. Let us suppose that country A this time, given the same amount of resources as country B, it can produce 10x. Country B, however, much more efficient, can produce 200x. Country A can only produce 20y. Country B can produce 120y. So a really big difference between these two. So you go, well, under these circumstances, there's no way, is there, that trade could be beneficial between these two countries if they specialise in, uh, in production. But I said the rule is, if opportunity costs are different, you can always produce gains from trade. Now here the opportunity costs are different because for country A, it's 20 over 10, 1x 
you give up 2y. 1y, you give up half x. B, it's 120 over 200, 3 fifths. It's 200 over 120, 5 thirds. The opportunity costs are here different. Now, if these countries just specialised in their own products and there was no um, uh, trade uh, at all between them, then you can see we could produce between us 210x and 140y. Now, can I rearrange things and produce more than 210 and 140? Well, obviously I can because I said the rule is simple and straightforward. If opportunity costs are different, you can rearrange resources. No matter what the difference is between the relative efficiencies within both countries, and here it's really big, we can still rearrange and reorganise as illustrated here. All right, let us suppose we know that country A has got a comparative advantage in the production of Y. It's half X as opposed to one and two thirds X. So let's just produce in country A all Y. We'll produce no X, so it's zero production of X, and we're producing 40 Y. In country B, we're not going to shift over all resources. We can't shift over all resources and increase the total of both, but we can make a little shift. Let us produce another 20x. So we're producing 220x. Now, what will 220x mean that we've got to give up producing of y? So it'll be 23 fifths, which is 12. So if we produce 20 more x, we're going to produce 12 less y. So we can stop there because we've produced now 220x and last time we only had 210x. So we've got 10 more x and uh, last time we had 140y, we've now got 148y. So we have produced more of both things. Now you hopefully can have some fun with this because it doesn't matter what the difference is between A and B. It could be um, B instead of producing 220 here and, uh, uh, oh sorry, the original number of uh, 200. And uh, oh, got to go back to it to find that number now, isn't it? Uh, if under the original situation B produced 200 and 120 and we change that to 200,000 and 120,000, and A still only produces 10 and 20, we can still reorganize things and increase both totals. That is the proof that comparative advantage leads to gains from trade. And that is the whole basis of a world trading. You don't look at one country and go, they can produce everything better than us, so there's, it's not worth trading. It's always worth trading if you have a lower opportunity cost of production on some of your products compared with the other country. If, as I said, all opportunity costs are the same, there will be no gains from trade, but they're never likely to be that. They're always going to be different. So it doesn't matter that you've got countries out there which are more efficient and less efficient. Trade can actually benefit everyone, and there is always gains from trade if there is comparative advantage between countries. Now that's the, the real proof because it takes you one step on it. it. takes you the idea of absolute advantage easy to understand. But where one country can do all things better than another country, you can still gain from trade if there is a comparative advantage, which I hope uh, I have uh, illustrated to you there. Now, what all of this means when you're studying economics is that opportunity cost is always very important. And here, opportunity cost uh, tells you that uh, almost always there'll be gains from international trade. It applies internally as well as international, internationally, but uh, here we're just using it to illustrate why we trade across national boundaries. It also tells you who will specialise in what because it's the country which has the lowest opportunity cost that will allocate more resources to their specialist product. Further than that, uh, the opportunity costs tell you the limits to exchange as well. 
So if we look at this uh, example here, uh, the terms of trade, the rate at which you would trade x for y, has got to lie between the two opportunity cost figures reading vertically. So 1x has got to trade for a number that's between uh, 3 fifths y and 2y, or 1y has got to trade with a number that's between half x and 1 and 2 thirds x. If it didn't do that, both countries wouldn't gain. If you are at the limit of 2y or 3 fifths y, then one country would gain and the other country wouldn't gain or lose. If you move outside, then one country gains and the other country loses. But if you take the opportunity cost as the limits to trade, then trade will lie somewhere between those two. It's not half for you and half for us. It just depends upon conditions of supply and demand all the time that you have got uh, uh, free trade taking place in your economy. So what we've done is opportunity cost tells you who will produce what. It gives you the limits uh, to exchange and it says the real terms of trade how much of one you will trade for the other must lie between those two opportunity cost figures. So it's all um, very theoretical and uh, very simplified, but I hope you see it it's produces a very important uh, illustration of why we want trade to be free trade around the world so that we can take advantage of all of uh, these situations. So the basis of the theory of comparative advantage is the world will be better off if we all trade freely with each other. So the question is, does that happen? The answer no. There's lots of protective barriers around uh, countries and around groups of countries. The question I suppose is are there good economic reasons for this or are they not economic reasons? Are they other moral or political uh, reasons of one sort or another? Uh, a strategic reason, for example, suppose you're likely to go to war with your neighbour and your neighbour country uh, happened to provide you with all of your food. If your neighbour country provided you with all of your food and you went to war with them, uh, then you're likely to lose within a few days when you get a bit hungry and uh, you've got no food left. So strategically, you might say, we're not as good as this other country at producing food, but we better produce some of our own just in case we go to war with them and then uh, uh, we won't get starved out uh, and lose within a very... F so that's not an economic reason for... Uh, protecting yourself from free trade. There are some examples uh, in economic textbooks uh, about why you should protect yourself. Uh, unfair trading practices might be a reason to protect yourself. If one country, uh, the government is subsidising a particular industry to get prices down below costs and then sell them in your country to damage your industry and destroy your industry so that it can sort of take over your market. That will be considered to be an unfair trading practice. It's, it's called dumping, uh, where you're selling at below costs of production. And uh, one might say, well, we had better protect ourselves against uh, that argument. There's an infant industry argument, uh, which has some strength to it, uh, whereby uh, countries are at different uh, points along the growth uh, scale. Uh, some are much better off than others. And for a country that's just starting, a third world country wants to become a second and a first world country, uh, it might be important to protect your own industry while it develops, while it takes advantage of economies of scale and becomes a player which, who can compete on the world stage. So there is an infant industry argument. There's also a senile industry argument where everything's gone wrong and you think, well, let's protect this uh, industry for a little while while it gets itself back on its feet and then we can let it back into the uh, economy. However, there's a problem with this form of protection uh, and that is uh, a moral hazard, uh, a political problem here because for every government that offers protection to an industry, 
it will gain votes and people will say, yeah, what a good government protecting our iron and steel industry or our coal industry or our farm industry or whatever it is. Uh, so there are votes involved in offering protection. There are, however, uh, no votes in removing that protection, which means that some sort of temporary protection often turns into a permanent protection because no government in a democracy is brave enough to remove the protection because it knows there's absolutely no political advantage in doing that. In effect, what you're doing is giving advantage to people in other countries to enter your market and compete with your um, company. So you, you have uh, a little bit uh, of uh, a problem here. But in an industry, the growth of an industry, a little bit of protection might help. Japan was very good uh, after the Second World War in building up its uh, motorcycle and uh, car industry by protecting itself. Uh, it had a, a number of schemes. I remember that uh, its cars used to be one inch narrower than the competitive cars in Europe because in Japan uh, there were tax bans. Uh, and the tax ban was based upon the width of the car. And if you uh, were one inch smaller, the Japanese cars had very little additional purchase tax on them, whereas any imports from Europe had a much higher tax put on them to make it uh, less competitive for, for a consumer to look to buy an imported car. You could still sell cars in Japan. It was just a big disadvantage in doing it. And one other one I remember now having said that, in Tokyo, uh, you had lots of uh, um, government car parks, and if you had a foreign car, you couldn't car you couldn't park in any of these car parks. If you had a Japanese car, you could, which obviously meant there's a significant disadvantage in not having a Japanese car. So there there are lots of little things uh, going on uh, behind the scene, but there are some reasons for protection. But bearing in mind we started with the idea that free trade is the best, uh, we don't really want to see countries developing protective barriers of one sort or another uh, around uh, uh, them. Which means, well, over time lots of protective barriers have grown and people have gradually realised the disadvantages of protective barriers. So there have been political decisions to try and develop free trade areas, uh, customs union areas, areas where freer trade might take place, where the feeling is that we would all be better off if there was much freer trade between us. And the idea of a customs union, is it a good idea or a bad idea? Well, it's a good idea if it's moving you towards freer trade, certainly not a good idea if it's moving you away from freer trade and, it, and actually erecting barriers. But it's moving you to free trade. Good thing customs unions. Customs unions are where a group of countries get together and they have free trade between themselves and they have a common external tariff. That's exactly what the EU was in its embryonic form, which was the uh, European Economic Community, the EEC. So that was just a customs union which was producing free trade. It had one little internal problem which was its common agricultural policy which actually went against the idea of a customs union and did interfere with prices but that's that's another story that we can look into. There are countries that produce free trade areas that you trade freely uh, inside uh, that area but you don't have a common external barrier against the rest of the world. You allow each member country of this free trade area to have its own barriers against the rest of the world. Uh, you have sort of one step on from a free trade area to try and develop single markets. And then you have what I would consider to be the real problem, and that's where you try and turn this free trade area into an economic uh, and political union as we did with uh, the EEC, which eventually uh, moved to become the European Union. So, uh, all right, a few words uh, just about uh, the EEC, because I, was, I am a great fan of free trade. So I'm a great fan of 
customs unions if they step towards free trade, free trade areas. So uh, in 1975, when there was a referendum, do, does the UK want to stay inside uh, the EEC? Uh, my answer uh, was yes, because it's free trade. And it's freer trade because the common external tariff was then the lowest of all of the member countries' barriers against the rest of the world. So everything was moving towards uh, free trade, although there was that problem, as I sort of hinted, with the common agricultural policy. But that, uh, that's something that uh, we'll, we would have to look at uh, somewhere else. So when we come to another referendum, do you want to stay or do you want to leave? This time, I have to admit it, I'm one of the very few economists who said, yes, we've got to leave. I voted to leave uh, because I didn't see the free trade area as morphing into a political union. And I have problems with government, as you've probably realised if you've watched this right from the bottom uh, to the top, uh, because governments are basically wasteful. They don't know what they're doing. They can't they, they respond to a vote motive, not economic incentive. So you very rarely get governments doing anything efficiently unless it was just uh, by luck. So I don't like layers of government. You know, local authorities, they're inefficient. National governments, they're inefficient. International, supranational governments, they're in inefficient as well. So I don't want one layer of inefficiency put on top of another layer of inefficiency and another layer of inefficiency. So if you look at the political union of the EU, I can see lots of bureaucratic waste, lots of costs which shouldn't be there, lots of waste in the way that uh, alloc resources are allocated. I can also see, and that was even more worrying, that where the EEC was set up, you had freer trade. But gradually over recent years, when you've had the political union develop, you're now introducing more trade barriers against the rest of the world, although you're arguably saying you're not. There are lots of little things which are protecting members of the European Union from trade against the rest of the world, whereas I don't want to see that as an economist. Uh, I don't want to see that uh, taking place. I just want to see barriers being reduced. So uh, you can read much more about this if you go to my blog. Uh, on my blog I explain uh, firstly before the last referendum in 2016 why I would vote to leave uh, and then I explain the problems of trying to leave. Uh, those problems are still there and you can read about uh, why they're there and what might be the outcome as I say uh, on my blog. Um, it's uh, the first one is Brexit, should we, uh, where I explain the waste that there is under uh, a political union and much better to remove that and get back to uh, free trade. Uh, and then uh, uh, that was uh, followed up by an article called Brexit and Beyond, uh, where I explained the advantages uh, of being out and the problems that there would be in getting out. Unfortunately, too many of those problems seem to have uh, manifested themselves, but we, we wait to see whether the final uh, step to leave uh, will take place. So what we've done now is we've had theory of comparative advantage. Great theory. When you understand it, you understand why we want free international trade, because the whole world will be better off on average. Um, obviously the being better off is not distributed equally or fairly, uh, but it's uh, a step in the right direction if there's just more out there for all of us to consume. And that would come uh, if the theory of comparative advantage uh, is allowed to work through international trade. Now we do have a problem uh, with uh, countries which have different currencies. So it does mean that when foreigners want to buy UK products, they actually have to buy sterling to buy UK products. And when we want to buy American products, we have to buy dollars to buy American products. Um, and so you do need uh, to look at the balance of payments. The overall balance of payments between countries is always naught, it's zero. 
because all you're doing is measuring the flows of money going out of the country and coming into the country, all measured in the one domestic currency. Now you can think of three uh, sort of broad areas within uh, balance of payments accounts. One is account account, which looks at the value of all of the goods and services you sell abroad against the value of all the goods and services that you buy from abroad. And that figure can be uh, a big surplus, a big deficit, uh, or it could even be a zero balance on its own. Then there's a capital account. And the capital account is looking at things which uh, really transfer ownership from one country to another. So if I buy myself a nice uh, uh, holiday apartment in Corfu uh, uh, and then I end up renting it out and, and I receive rent that comes back to the UK, uh, there's uh, a flow initially with the purchase of a property abroad and then there's another flow which would, is actually recorded on the current account. But the capital account records the transfers of ownership between one country and another country, or more precisely, the people in one country and the people in another country. And then when you put all of these accounts together, they can produce flows, which uh, might be a deficit flow uh, in your currency or uh, a surplus flow. And so you have a final official financial account, which just wipes out any differences uh, and produces the zero balance on the balance of payments. So you might say, well, if the balance of payments is always zero, why do we bother about it? And indeed, there's a big question, why do we bother about it? But uh, what we mustn't miss is the current account. The current account of the balance of payments is uh, really the long-term account that you want to balance if you don't want to have a number of uh, uh, distorting uh, factors uh, damaging your economy. Because if the current account is uh, in deficit, they call it a fundamental deficit, uh, a, a persistent deficit, then problems do manifest themselves. A persistent surplus, problems manifest themselves there. Temporary disequilibriums will always exist. Month on month, you don't know whether the value of exports will equal the value of imports. Um, but over time, you would expect uh, those things to work out unless you've got a permanent problem, unless you've got a permanent overvaluation of your currency, which will tend to produce surpluses or an undervaluation, uh, sorry, an undervaluation of your currency, which would produce surpluses, or an overvaluation of your currency, which will produce deficits. Now, you can't really have permanent deficits on the current account of your balance of payments. But we do seem to have that. For the USA, deficit year after year after year. Now they have a sort of advantage in as much as they're the world's reserve currency. And if you're the world's reserve currency, uh, then uh, you can often run deficits on your internal budget accounts and your external accounts because other countries are happy to absorb surplus dollars and stick them into idle balances in their central banks, uh, build up their reserves. So there's some scope to run quite uh, sufficient uh, and long-term deficits in that situation. Even the UK has had quite a lot of uh, uh, deficits. It's not a reserve currency. It used to be, not now. So how do we get away with it? Well, we usually have to sell our wealth to foreigners to make up the, uh, uh, the deficit. So you will find that uh, lots of uh, places in the UK, lots of companies in the UK, lots of buildings in the UK are now owned by people in other countries. So they've used money to buy assets, which has offset some of the problems that we have had by having a rather persistent or long-term deficit on the current account of our balance of payments. Where does it all end? I suppose it ends with foreigners owning this country, which is fine. We don't mind them owning it as long as we're working in it and deriving our uh, income from it. It won't affect our standards of living, uh, who owns it, uh, other than just perhaps a little bit. So the balance of payments has a significant account. Look at it always, the current account of the balance of payments. That's the one that you really want to observe if you want to see how well a country is doing. 
and broadly speaking you want the current account of the balance of payments to roughly be zero over a long period of time. You don't want persistent deficits and indeed you don't want persistent surpluses because if you have persistent surpluses it just means that you're selling abroad more of the goods and services that you produce than you're buying from abroad which means technically you're consuming less than you could consume which means your standard of living is lower than it need be. Uh, the sort of problem that China has with its large surpluses on its current account I mean the Chinese people actually suffer uh, a lower standard of living than they would otherwise have if the uh, balance of payments current account in China was nearer to being balanced or nearer to zero. So there are a few things there uh, on uh, balance of payments that you must familiarise yourself with uh, and the last thing that we're going to look at uh, today will be the um, exchange rates. Now the exchange rate situation uh, is uh, nice and easy. We've, we've got, we know something about supply and demand curves, uh, don't we? Uh, but before we mention that, uh, there, was a, there was a fairly simple theory of exchange rate determination called purchasing power parity. It didn't actually work, um, but uh, more or less it said that the exchange rate needs to reflect the purchasing power of the currency in each country. Now what that means is if I took £100 in the UK and went to London and went into shops and bought a basket of products, could I take that £100 to Tokyo, change it into yen, so I get say 135 yen uh, when I'm in Tokyo. Could I go into the same shops, because there are the same shops in Tokyo as there are London, could I go in the same shops and buy the same basket of products? If I could buy the same basket of products, uh, then uh, the purchasing power parity different will be £100, gives you 135 yen. But if I couldn't do that, then the purchasing power parity would be different. And in fact, it's, it's unlikely uh, that uh, uh, I could do that and it would probably be the case that £100 in the UK uh, I could probably um, uh, buy 10% less in Tokyo uh, because the exchange rate is lower than the purchasing power parity between these two countries. Not between all countries, it will vary from one country uh, to another because the exchange rate is determined just by a small proportion of the output of your economy and the other. It's those flows across international boundaries which determine the exchange rate. In other words, the flow of funds which cross national boundaries. Uh, whereas purchasing power parity includes all things produced in one country and another. They're not the same thing, which means that for exchange rates, you're really looking at the foreign exchange rate determined by supply and demand in uh, foreign exchange markets. So it's quite a simple um, diagram. You remember we know what supply and demand curves look like now, don't they? So we've got here uh, a simple downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve and a nice equilibrium price for our rate of exchange. But two things on this diagram you need to be careful of uh, and you need to be warned about. On the horizontal axis here you're measuring quantity but you're measuring the quantity of pounds or the quantity of sterling entering foreign exchange markets and uh, leaving foreign exchange markets. On the vertical axis you're measuring the price of the currency. Now you can't measure the price of the currency in, uh, in sterling it's got to be measured in another currency. So here I've got the dollar sign. So you can measure the price of sterling in dollars or, or yen or euros or any other currency you like, uh, but you can't measure it in its own uh, currency. So you can't measure pounds in sterling. You've got to measure them in some other form. So be careful, make uh, a note of that when you are using your supply and demand curves that the vertical axis uh, must have uh, a different currency on it. One other thing to notice, um, uh, here we've actually made an assumption uh, because the supply and demand curve are both determined by demands, which can be a little bit confusing. It's the demand for our exports, which 
is the demand for our currency. And it's our demand for imports, which is the supply of our currency. So demand for imports supplies currency to the foreign exchange market. Demand for exports demands currency from that market. So two demands here determine the demand and supply curves for a currency. And in fact, this supply curve with this shape actually means that the demand for imports is elastic. Now that takes us back uh, to our second lecture where you needed to understand a little bit about elasticity. And you remember from elasticity that I can lower the price of a product and more will be bought. But more could be spent buying more, the same amount could be spent buying more, or less could be spent buying more, which does mean that this supply curve does have uh, three different potential shapes. The demand curve is uh, always uh, the same, but the elasticity of demand for imports can produce supply functions that look like that. So the normal one, which we saw on the previous diagram, means the elasticity of demand for the product is greater than one. If the elasticity of demand was one, then the supply curve would actually be vertical. And if it's less than one, it would actually be backward bending uh, from left to right. Uh, so uh, it's uh, a little confusion, but you can read all about it uh, if you read the relevant, uh, relevant chapter. So exchange rates uh, you can think about in terms of floating or free exchange rates. But not all exchange rates are free and floating. And in fact, we've gone through long parts of our history where exchange rates have been fixed. And exchange rates uh, have been fixed where both fixed and floating are determined by market forces. No difference there. It's just that when you have a fixed exchange rate, a central bank would have to intervene and buy and sell in that market in order to keep the price at an agreed rate that it has been announced by your government. Our currency will be fixed at this level with a margin of movement on either side, which is very small before it will be taken back to the central number within this uh, range. So fixed rates of exchange uh, are what we had for many years, certainly in the 50s uh, and 60s, uh, of the last century uh, before we ended up uh, with a currency which floats and a value for our currency which is fixed by market forces on foreign exchange markets. Now there are significant advantages of course in having a fixed uh, exchange rate because a fixed exchange rate is very good for um, businessmen. They know that if the rate today is this and they agree to buy something in the foreign currency at this price, they know that that price will be the same in three months time and six months time in terms of sterling because sterling is fixed against that currency. So businessmen like the idea of fixed exchange rates. However, uh, if we go back to our current balance disequilibriums, our deficits and surpluses, uh, if you have an overvalued currency, uh, it means that you're likely to have a consistent and persistent surplus on the current account. If you have, I've said it wrong again, silly me. It's where you make one mistake, isn't it? And you repeat that mistake again. Let me go again. If you have a persistent surplus on the current account of your balance of payments, it means your currency is undervalued. Your currency should have a higher value in a marketplace, in a free market. Where you have a persistent deficit on the current account of your balance of payments, it means that the value of your currency is uh, it's overvalued. Now, if you have a fixed system and your currency becomes overvalued or undervalued, then if that persists, you're going to have to do something internally to change that, or you could devalue or revalue your currency, change the point that you fix it. That's something that's overcome automatically, day by day, hour by hour, when the currency floats up and down. 
So you, you have very small adjustments uh, every hour of every day, very, very small adjustments as the currency moves and responds to market forces. Fixes mean it can't respond to market forces and therefore it could become out of line with a market rate. And when it becomes out of line with a market rate, you do have a real problem. It creates for speculators what's called a speculator's paradise because if your currency is permanently overvalued or undervalued, you know that it is going to either be adjusted up or adjusted down, one fixed point to another. So you can bet on that. You can buy into that currency or sell that currency uh, knowing that if the change takes place, you'll make lots of money. And if the change doesn't take place, you won't lose anything. That's what a speculator's paradise is. That's why fixed exchange rates are good for businessmen, but not good in terms of allowing market forces to make adjustments as dynamic economies move at different paces and economic growth rates are different in different countries. So you do have to, um, or it's better to have a floating system which allows flexibility and modest adjustments to uh, the foreign exchange. So foreign exchange rates are now floating and closer to being market rates, although there is always interference by governments on trying to maintain that rate at something which is slightly different from what would be the market rate. Of course, the ultimate fix would be to change uh, into a single currency, like the Eurozone, so 19 of the 27, soon to be 26 countries of the uh, European Union are members of a Eurozone, which means they traded in all their currencies for uh, the Euro. Great advantages in doing that because as a traveller now throughout the Eurozone countries, you don't have to carry lots of different currencies. There's no trading costs involved in changing currencies. All prices are transparent. They're all measured in Euros. There are efficiency gains in doing that. Contracted prices in business can't change, just like the fixed exchange rate. It's nice for, for business to be like that. And uh, uh, you re reduce speculation in terms of uh, domestic changes in uh, uh, member countries, although there is still the potential for the euro to change against, say, the dollar or indeed sterling, because we're not part uh, of that. So there are big advantages in having a single currency, and there will be big advantages in having one currency in the world. Um, but also there are disadvantages. Some of the disadvantages are just to do with the costs of transition from one system with lots of different currencies into one new one because you can find yourself uh, uh, by agreeing a rate which was uh, too high or too low when you enter, as we found uh, uh, when it originally happened. So there are costs of transition. There are problems within countries because you no longer have any access to your domestic monetary policy. The monetary policy is run by one group, the European Central Bank. And if they manage things badly, then it's badly across all countries. So there's no central bank saying, no, we do that differently. We do it much better. Uh, I'm not saying the EU is uh, actually bad. Sorry, the uh, Eurozone is actually badly managed uh, because uh, there is a, uh, a big advantage in uh, having a member, Germany, who really suffered problems uh, uh, with uh, hyperinflation and knew a bit about it, uh, how to manage money, uh, and they've tended to manage the quantity of money quite well to keep inflation very low. Uh, they have, however, made a mistake, I think, on the price of money. That's they've moved their interest rates around uh, uh, too much. Uh, and the euro is under pressure. One of the reasons it's under pressure is that to, to work perfectly, it needed to have rules about its fiscal policies and its national debts for all the countries that are member countries uh, of the Eurozone. Um, uh, those rules were never followed. Uh, in fact, there was a 3% uh, GDP uh, borrowing, GDP to borrowing rule each year and a 60% limit on uh, uh, national income. Uh, the yearly accumulations of, uh, of debt to, uh, to GDP uh, and in fact Germany and France were the first ones to break it uh, many years ago because I think they went in uh, with uh, a number that they fixed their rates too high uh, and they had problems uh, so they adjusted their domestic policies uh, but uh, it is a real problem 
uh, for the EU that it's trying to manage a situation where there are a number of fiscal changes taking place in the countries which damage and offset uh, the, um, the central monetary policy of the ECB. Uh, we've already mentioned it uh, with the global financial crisis that agreements were made for countries to have rather large fiscal deficits that destabilised uh, the euro and the euro has never really recovered from that and where we go into the future with the euro I do not know but we wait and see whether or not uh, it will survive as a currency or whether we go back to domestic uh, currencies. I have written again several articles on the blog about what might happen if we unwind the euro. I'll leave you to read about those things uh, at your leisure should you like that. So for international trade what have we said here that's important? We have said firstly the theory of comparative advantage proves that the world economy will be better off if we all trade freely. We said, unfortunately, there are uh, protections which destabilise that development and perhaps they are things that we should try and remove if we possibly can. We said that there's an added problem because countries do have different currencies, so we have to think about uh, balance of payments and fixing rates of exchange, allowing rates of exchange to fluctuate, and we've looked at some of the theories which underlie that. Now, I hope you found the 10 lectures a sort of useful introduction to economics. It's fairly simple, fairly straightforward, so it's, it's not designed to be difficult and complex. Complex comes next. If you can get the simple stuff clear in your mind, then you can build on the complexities through studying your behavioural economics, your development economics, your econometrics, uh, all the other developments. But if you start with a sort of clear logic, simple theories, and you can understand their strengths and more importantly their weaknesses, then you can go on to build uh, a more uh, a fuller understanding of a world that's pretty chaotic, uh, but you don't really want to start uh, on the principle of let's uh, say the world is, is chaos uh, and let's try and understand that. You say, well, let's try and understand the world uh, if it was logical, straightforward, and everyone was rational and did all the things that we would expect of them. And then when we understand that, we can start to think what might happen if things go wrong. So I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, that uh, and if you put all 10 lectures together you'll have an idea of economics as a whole. If you just want to pick individual lectures then uh, they may tidy up for you uh, various uh, uh, levels of understanding at a micro level or a macro level. I will come back uh, a little bit later on with some more lectures on individual topics and perhaps a series of lectures on uh, money banking and finance. Um, so keep a view on, on YouTube and uh, enjoy yourself and I hope I have been some help in you understanding something about uh, the subject of economics. Thank you.